have you ever experienced that thing where you just like you find a certain subject or a certain topic or or whatever it is and you just absolutely fall in love with it it's just fascinating to you for some people it's history for some people it's music theory or just you could just go on and on with the list of things well that feeling of just total enthrallment fascination total investment in wanting to know as much as you can about it that's how i feel about the subject of this series of videos we'll be talking about um, that is the personality of god now i'm going to share more about what all we'll be doing in there but before i get into that i just kind of wanted to establish first of all that there is an early sda doctrine a pillar doctrine in fact known as the personality of god and in order to do that i'd like to share this statement from alan white uh, this is written in 1905 and she specifically mentions this as one of the pillar doctrines she says those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast they are not remembering how they have received and heard those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Now there's uh, some more that I want to read from this manuscript, but before I do that, uh, I thought it might be nice to quote from another source um, in addition to this one. And this is to uh, give a little bit of Ellen White's description of how these pillar doctrines were established in the first place. So this is from a letter um, to John Harvey Kellogg, actually, letter 253, 1903. And she, she relates to him. She says, my husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Edson, and many others who were keen, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, searched for truth. At our important meetings, these men would meet together and search for the truth as for hid treasure, as for hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly, for we felt that we must learn God's truth. Often we remained together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. As we fasted and prayed, great power came upon us, but I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend what we were studying. Then the Spirit of God would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to the position we were to take regarding truth and duty. Again and again this happened. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was plainly marked out before me, and I gave my brethren and sisters the instruction that the Lord had given me. They knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given me. Thus, the leading points of our faith, as we hold them today, were firmly established. Point after point was clearly defined, and all the brethren came into harmony. So these are important points. And she goes on to say, the whole company of believers were united in the truth. Now, these are really important things to keep in mind as we continue on to um, look at the history and context of the subject, the personality of God. She says, there were those who came in with strange doctrines, but we were never afraid to meet them. Our experience was wonderfully established by the revelations of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So now let's return to that earlier statement from the manuscript, the one where she identifies the personality of God as one of the pillars of our faith. And remember, we just saw the letter that she had written to John Harvey Kellogg, where she explained that the 
these pillars were established through, you know, a lot of time spent in prayer and study. And still, they weren't able to understand, including her, they weren't able to understand the truth of the matter until she was taken in vision and divine revelation was um, given her and she gave the instruction to the people. And then they were all united in the truth. So with that in mind, let's continue now to read from this manuscript. She goes on to say, the messages that we have received from heaven are true and faithful. When one man strives to bring in new theories, which are not the truth, the ministers of God should bear clear warning against these theories, pointing out where, if received, they would lead the people of God. Those who have received the light of present truth should not be easily deceived and readily led from the true path into strange paths. The watchmen are to be wide awake to discern the outcome of all specious reasoning, for serious errors will be brought in to lead the people of God astray. When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation, which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. Now, of course, remember, this was written in 1905, and there were still some of those early pioneers from very early on um, who were still alive. Not very many, but there were some. But then she also says, let those who are dead speak also by reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. So, of course, today that would apply to all of them. Um, there aren't any living pioneers, obviously. But anyway, and then she goes on, gather up the rays of divine light that God has given as he has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. This truth will stand the test of time and trial. So there's a few things here that um, I, I wanted to kind of bring out, uh, you know, from these two sources, these statements from these two sources. And one of them, again, is just the fact that there is a pillar doctrine known as the personality of God. It's just one of the pillars, but that's what we're going to be talking about in this series of videos. So there's a pillar doctrine and it wasn't weakly established. It wasn't possibly true. It was definitely true. It was established by divine revelation. And she says that it's the same position that, you know, they were still uh, supposed to take in 1903 and 1905, etc. Now, um, she also, uh, the other thing I wanted to bring out from these statements is that she is saying that all of the people, all the the early believers came into harmony. They were all united in these pillar truths. And she also said that we should be reprinting, republishing or sharing or whatever, um, reprinting the pioneers articles on these pillar doctrines. Now, obviously she wouldn't do that if she didn't believe that they were teaching the truth of it. So it's really important to keep that in mind that if Ellen White thought that the pioneers were teaching error on the personality of God, she would not have promoted their writings as teaching the truth, which she clearly does. So this is um, a direct endorsement of the pioneers understanding of the personality of God. So here's what we're going to be doing in this series of studies or series of videos. Um, and they will be a bit of a study, but it's not so much, you know, the, your typical Bible study. We're, we're going to be examining these writings to know what they say about certain things. We're going to be, um, we're going to be looking at what did the early SDAs mean by saying things like, God is a person. What did they mean by that? What did they mean by saying God has a person or God has a personality? God is a personage. It's another way they expressed things. Sometimes they say in the writings, God is a personal being. We'll see what those statements mean. And another phrase that they use sometimes is personally. 
God is in heaven. Now, in order to understand what they meant by those phrases, of course, it'll be, you know, vital to understand, well, what did they mean by the word person? And um, J.H. Wagner understood this. Uh, in, in the broader theological world, there was not the unity um, on personhood that there was within the early Seventh-day Adventist movement. He writes um, in Signs of the Times, March 4, 1875, and again, this is in the context of the broader theological world. He says, prevailing ideas of person are very diverse, often crude, and the word is differently understood. Okay, well, while that, again, is the case outside of Adventism, in the early SDA movement, they had that unity. They had um, a unity on the pillar doctrine of the personality of God. So they weren't at odds with one another regarding what it meant to be a person. So as we continue, we're going to be looking at specifically what do the um, early pioneers' writings reveal about their meaning of the word person and its variants like personality, personally, personage, and, and that sort of thing. And in order to do that, um, we could just start at, you know, 1844 with the people Ellen White mentioned in her letter to Kellogg. But I thought it might be better to go back just a tiny bit before that, like just in the Advent movement phase, the, the phase um, just prior to when the Seventh Day Adventists really started to come together as a movement. And so we just need to go back to this guy, William Miller. He uh, may be known or familiar to you, to you all. Maybe you've at least heard his name and, and you know a bit about that, you know, he's connected with Seventh-day Adventism. And some of you may know very, very well a lot of history about William Miller. But just in a nutshell, he was the one who brought the first angel's message of Revelation 14. He started preaching in 1831 with this first angel's message. And um, basically, we're just we're, we're not going to look at any of the time charts. We're not getting into that sort of stuff. We are just wanting to understand how he was using the word person in relation to the message that Jesus was coming back soon. So um, we'll start with the history and context of just the pre-SDA movement. So it's still Adventists. And this is where the early Seventh-day Adventists came from. They first started out just promoting the advent of Jesus. Um, and as we go through, we'll just look at, I, I, I think I, if I remember correctly, I have like three or four different people's quotes that we're going to look at from their writings. And we're going to see um, what it can inform us regarding the, the linguistic pool, basically, of the early SDA movement. What were they meaning when they said Jesus was coming back soon? Because not only did they say that Jesus was coming back soon, really a big focus of the message was that he was coming back personally. And we'll see that from this statement, um, this excerpt from an article that uh, William Miller wrote. It was a letter to the editor of the Vermont Telegraph, which is a periodical back in the day. And this is found in Vermont Telegraph, October 30, 1832. So the editor of the periodical is a man named Walker. And so William Miller starts out by saying, Brother Walker, at the earnest solicitation of some of your readers, I have consented to give my views of the personal reign of Christ through the medium of the telegraph. The Reverend A. Fuller says, First, the idea of a personal reign appears to me nearly to exclude that of a spiritual one by leaving little or no place for it. Okay, so while this, this isn't supposed to tell us what William Miller meant by the word person, but it's just showing that there's this context of opposition between people who were, um, you know, well, 
other people besides William Miller who weren't promoting the soon personal reign of Christ. So William Miller was uh, proclaiming the soon personal reign of Christ. And this Reverend Andrew Fuller says the idea of a personal reign appears to him to nearly exclude that of a spiritual one. So right there, you can see that the words personal and spiritual are at odds. They're meaning different things. If you have a personal reign of Christ, it excludes the need of having a spiritual reign. So that can help us to see and, you know, kind of like the context of what the controversy or some of the controversy was surrounding. What did it mean to promote the soon personal reign of Christ versus a spiritual reign? That'll help us to understand what they meant by the word person. But this next quote from William Miller actually gives us direct uh, insight into his understanding, his meaning of the word person, what he meant by saying personal reign of Christ. He says, oh, and this statement is from uh, a periodical called The Midnight Cry, uh, November 22, 1842. And he says, I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God, having a body in fashion and form like man, divine in his nature, human in his person, godlike in his character and power. So this is really great. This is so concise and so clear that he's saying Jesus has a body in fashion and form like man. So he's human in his person, in his body. Okay. So that's enough to get a very clear statement from William Miller regarding what he meant by saying that Jesus is a person and that he was going to reign personally on David's throne his person is his body. So he would be reigning bodily. You know, like if I said, I'm coming to your place in person, it's kind of that sort of thing. You know, that me in, in the flesh, you know, I'm going to be there. So that is, um, his meaning of the word person. Now, the next statement we're going to look at is from this guy, Charles Fitch. He actually brought the second angel's message in 1843. And again, we're not going to be getting into any time prophecies or, you know, any, any of that sort of extra stuff. You know, the more common stuff that you usually might think of when you think of these various angels messages and all that, I just wanted you to know who these people are. Okay. So he brought the second angel's message in 1843. And here is a statement of his from one of his sermons that was then printed in a periodical in 1843. And uh, let's just see what he says here. But did Jesus Christ come in the flesh for no purpose but to suffer? Here, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, after he had been baptized with the Holy Ghost and fully qualified to set forth the objects of Christ's coming. So in other words, he's saying, you know, Here's what Peter has to say. And Peter knew what he was talking about because he was just anointed with the Holy Ghost, right? He was just baptized with the Holy Ghost. And he said, he quotes from Acts 2.29 and says, this is Peter, of course. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, his David's throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, etc. And all of that in italics, that's not me emphasizing it for the meaning of the word person necessarily. This is um, just the way it was printed in the periodical. Uh, but he goes on to say, Here we are informed that God had sworn with an oath to David that he would raise up Christ in the flesh 
to sit on David's throne. That's the whole personally reigning on David's throne. So he's pointing to the fact that one of the reasons Christ came in the flesh wasn't just to suffer. He's pointing to Peter's statement in Acts and he says one of the reasons is because there was a promise that God made to David that he would raise Christ up in the flesh to sit on David's throne. Christ was therefore to come in the flesh to reign on David's throne and was raised up from the dead with flesh and bones for that purpose, to reign on David's throne in the flesh. And in that same body ascended to heaven and angels declared that he would so come again in like manner as he went into heaven. Now, as his ascension is personal, okay, his coming must be personal. So are, you know, you're probably catching the connections here, I hope, but I will, you know, we'll just comment a little bit anyway. It's always good to really digest what we're reading. He's really stressing the fact that Peter declared that God promised with an oath to David, ancient King David, that he would have the fruit of his loins, a human descendant to reign on his throne. and. He's saying that one of the reasons Jesus came in the flesh was for that very purpose, to fulfill the promise made to the ancient King David. And of course, Christ died, but he was raised up from the dead with flesh and bones for that purpose. So he's pointing to the physical resurrection of Jesus. Then he says, in that same body, the body of flesh and bones, Jesus ascended to heaven and angels declared that Jesus would come again in the same manner that he went into heaven. So all of that, he says, all of that. And then he says, well, hey, his ascension was personal. So all of that description is informing us of what he meant by personal. He's not using it to mean something like intimate or caring or, you know, sympathetic or kind of like, you know, character traits. He's not using personal to describe intimacy or secrecy or anything like that. He's saying it was physical. It was bodily. And as his ascension is personal, his coming must be personal. And that was what Reverend A. Fuller was objected to. Like, hey, if his coming, you know, if, if his reign is to be personal, well, that seems to nearly exclude that of a spiritual reign. Okay. So, and, and throughout the series, we'll see more and more clearly what they meant by spiritual versus personal and that sort of thing. It's pretty important to the whole topic. So, um, but we can't cover everything at once. So we'll just take it bit by bit as we go. Now, um, I think I have one more slide of his. I do. So he goes on to say, now, as surely as the birth of Christ was personal and not spiritual, there's that contrast there, personal, not spiritual. So as surely as the birth of Christ was personal and not spiritual, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, personal. He's saying all of those, his life was personal. His death was personal, his resurrection was personal, and his ascension was personal. All of those things are personal, meaning physical bodily. So surely his coming must be. As he has taught in Luke 19, he has now gone into a far country to receive to himself a kingdom and to return. And he shall so come again in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's quoting what the angels said to the disciples as they watched Jesus ascend to heaven. Fitch goes on to say, in Psalm 89, we read, Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Then Jesus Christ has come in the flesh to sit on David's throne. He is to sit upon it 
personally and forever. For at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, there shall be heard great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, so really the first part of that last slide is the most important. So after all of this saying, you know, Jesus was born, his birth was personal, not spiritual. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, it's all personal. That was all personal and so must his coming be. And that's why he came in the flesh to sit on David's throne. So the whole bodily and flesh, flesh and bones, that's what he meant by personal and personally. Okay. So the next person we're going to look at, I, I couldn't find any pictures for this guy. I looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find any pictures for this guy, but his name is John J. Porter. And uh, this is from June 15, 1844, a periodical called The Voice of Truth and Glad Tidings of the Kingdom at Hand. And um, here's what he says. He says, Christ was raised up personally, i.e. his flesh was raised up according to promise that he might reign on the throne of his father, David. Okay, so these Adventists, you know, that was really you know, something that they really made very, very clear that they weren't talking about um, a spiritual reign of Christ as in, you know, just kind of thinking about it and, 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 you know, character traits or anything like that. Like they really emphasized that he was returning bodily in the flesh. Christ was raised up personally. And then he's just so, it's so great. It's so clear. I E you know, like, for example, or, or in other words, his flesh was raised up. So personally is corresponding to in the flesh. And um, I think I have another quote from him. I do. He says, many more passages might be brought forward to show the correctness of the position I have taken, but sufficient have been given to show the fallacy of that preaching that points beyond the bounds of time and space to the place where Christ reigns spiritually on David's throne. Okay. So this is good. This is good. This really helps, you know, when you have two terms that are put in contrast to one another, if you can really understand the meaning of one, it helps to better understand the meaning of the other because they're supposed to be the opposite or in contrast with one another. It doesn't have to be the opposite in every detail necessarily, but often the case it is. And, um, this is really one of those instances here. Now, notice here that he's point what what he's describing to you as a as something that is spiritually done is the whole idea of being beyond the bounds of time and space to the place where Christ reigns spiritually. So, something that is beyond the bounds of time and space is supposed to refer to the idea of something completely immaterial or non-physical like it's not made up of matter um and it, it doesn't have any constraints by space or time so that's the common view of uh the of god and of jesus and his reign is that it's beyond the bounds of time and space you know most christians think of life after death as this or or even the place of heaven as really not a place in space it's it's just a a realm beyond the physical they think of it as a spiritual realm that isn't physical and here john j porter is saying that the idea of pointing beyond the bounds of time and space to the place where Christ reigns spiritually on David's throne is a fallacious preaching. It's the fallacy that he's pointing to here. So in other words, it's erroneous. Um, it's, it's not good reasoning. Uh, fallacies are talking about um, errors in reasoning. But anyway, so that's what he means by spiritually. So if he's saying that Jesus isn't to reign spiritually, he's to reign personally, then personally for John J. Porter would be referring to something that is beyond, I'm sorry, <laughs> that is bound within 
time and space. Okay. Here he says the personal coming of Christ to reign personally on David's throne over immortal subjects raised from the dead and glorified with Christ, having bodies fashioned like unto his glorious body, appears to me to be the plain teaching of the word of God. And I hope all who are looking for Christ will remember to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints until the king shall return to reign and not suffer their minds to be diverted from this precious truth. Christ will soon take the kingdom. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun forever and ever. Okay, well, yeah, again, he brings it back to the bodily reign of Jesus and that that is what it means for Jesus to come personally, to reign personally, and it's going to be with his glorious fashioned body and that, the, you know, the righteous resurrected saints will also have uh, bodies fashioned like unto his glorious body. Okay, so we saw what John J. Porter means by personal and its variants. Uh, the next guy we're going to look at, I also couldn't find a picture for him, but his name is R. Winter. Those who spiritualize the coming of the Savior, to be consistent, should spiritualize his going away and say it was not personal in direct contradiction to his own declaration that he was not a spirit after his resurrection. Now, all the, the italics and the brackets, those are all original to the article. I don't know why the brackets was there. But anyway, the point here to notice is that he's saying, you know, that there's this contrast that we see here being made between spiritualizing Christ's coming and him coming personally. And he's saying, hey, those who want to say Christ is coming in a spiritual sense, those who spiritualize his coming should be consistent and say his going away was just spiritual, not personal. And then we'll see a little bit more of what he means by personal in this statement. It's just further on in the article. He says, if his second coming is spiritualized and made of none effect, then to have matters correspond, the drinking of the wine new in the kingdom of God must be nothingized too. So he, that's showing us what he means by spiritualized. So if his second coming is spiritualized, well, the drinking of the wine new in the kingdom of God must be nothingized too. And in the spirit of this doing away with the Bible truth, we must proceed to evaporate the description of the Last Supper itself. We are judgment bound and let us use the reason God has given us. Jesus went away personally and will so come in like manner as he went to heaven. He supped with his disciples the same night that he was betrayed and he will sup with them soon in the kingdom of God. So again, the point here is that we are looking to see how these people used the word person and its variants. Again, we're not trying to, to assert that something particular happened. We're not trying to um, even bring what we might think it means to be spiritualized or to be personal or anything like that. This is strictly for us to be looking at what can we glean from the context of the writings of these people themselves to see what did it mean to the Adventists prior to the Seventh-day Adventist movement, what did it mean to them to say Jesus was coming back personally? Because that'll tell us what the early Adventists meant by the word person. So it was, you know, the, the context here is showing that they meant something that was physical or bodily. It was his actual flesh and bones body that was his person. And for him to come personally meant for him to come in the flesh, bodily, et cetera, et cetera. So when William Miller first started preaching the soon personal reign of Jesus, then as more and more uh, people from all different types of religions, Christian religions, of course, as they started to um, accept 
that teaching that Jesus was coming back soon, they started joining in proclaiming that he was coming personally. And that was a huge part of this first angel's message. And then when the second angel's message joined it, it, it just reinforced everything, you know, like the, um, the people were united, as you can see from these statements in pointing to the physical, personal return of Jesus in contrast and in opposition to the idea of a spiritual coming of Jesus or a spiritual reign. Okay. So this was just the window into the history and context of the people who were looking for Jesus to come back soon. And after the passing of the time in 1844, these people who were proclaiming the personal return of Jesus now were meeting together and praying earnestly and fasting and seeking to understand these Bible truths. And it was during these times, during, during this time period, shortly after 1844, when these pillar SDA doctrines were established, such as the sanctuary and the personality of God and of Christ, etc. So as we continue, we're going to start looking at individual pioneer writings. And the next one, the next video in the series, we're, we're going to start with a man named David Arnold. So be sure and come back for that. We're going to look at an article that he wrote, not the whole thing, but the parts that are relevant for understanding what he meant by the word person and its variants. And we'll be looking at some of the corresponding or um, related passages from Ellen White as well that connect with um, just David Arnold's usage of the word person and in, in the particular context that he's using it. So I'm really looking forward to getting into the rest of this series with you. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to mention them in the comments below. There will be links in the description to all of the original sources that you can go and see personally, which I encourage you to do. Please take the time. It, it's super interesting. I, at least I hope you'll be as interested in it as I am. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And as some of you may know, and maybe you haven't heard this before, but um, I'll just drop this real quick, that Ella White did refer to the personality of God as being everything to us as a people. That's pretty important. So be sure and come back and join me for the next video. Thank you so much.